There we are. Welcome to the very first family workshop we're having this year for family partnership. Thank you guys for coming. I would just like to introduce my new friend, Rachel. I stumbled upon her curriculum, which is wild math and wild reading, because I was looking for something more hands-on, something outdoors, something that we could make the most of our summers and our springs here in Alaska and still be learning. And I'm just super excited to hear everything she's got to say to us today. So welcome, Rachel, and the mic is yours. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Um, so like you said, I'm Rachel Tidd, and I'm going to I'm the author of um, Wild Math and Wild Reading. I'm gonna share my screen here. So this is always fun. And then it's like, you know, the little Zoom thing's always in front of where you wanna click. So that's always fun. All right, can you see my screen now? Yay, okay. So yes, I am, and see now our, now our little pictures are in my way. I have to move myself, all right. So I'm Rachel Tidd, um, and I'm going to talk today a little about how you can integrate math into your homeschool and do it outside, especially, and some reading. I've got it all in there for you today. Um, and let's see here. I'm having trouble because it's like there. All right. So um, we released Wild Reading this year. So we became, we went from Wild Math to Wild Learning to encompass both of them. And we really... Um, we, meaning me, I'm the one that writes the curriculum and my husband helps me out. Um, so we really want to, kids and families to feel like the classroom can be outside. Um, it's an ideal place to learn and anything that you could do inside, you could also do outside. Um, we like to use nature as a tool for learning those essential math and reading skills. So I really try to, um, translate what might be done in a workbook or in a classroom and take it outside. That was my whole idea with wild math and wild reading. Um, I'm a homeschooling mom, two boys. They're currently 11 and eight. Um, I was a elementary special ed teacher for many years um, and I'm now a homeschooling parent. I have homeschooled my kids from the beginning. Um, they're lucky that the oldest one, um, we decided to homeschool. And then my youngest one, um, when he came along, he also um, got to homeschool, which was really, he was lucky because he had a lot of sensory issues and he has some learning disabilities. And so because we were already homeschooling, I think he really benefited the most from that. Um, I have a master's degree in elementary and special education from Bank Street College of Education in New York City, um, and I hold four teaching certificates in New York State, which is a lot. But sorry. So I just wanted to start with a few benefits of learning outside. Um, it increases engagement, it increases attention, it's got all that sensory stimulation built right in. Um, that was a big one for my youngest. That was one of the main reasons I started writing Wild Math um, is my youngest, who's in that picture, had a lot of sensory issues. And when he was at forest school, he had no problems. Um, when he was getting evaluated um, for services, we went to the uh, teachers there to fill out. You get like these things the teachers have to fill out. And they were like, what do you mean? We don't see any problems. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Because we're like, dying at home like he's always sensory seeking and doing all kinds of things and they're you know we dug into it more and all of his sensory needs were being met in that outdoor environment because they allowed you know you, you to cover yourself in mud or to play in the snow or to lick the ice in the stream or climb trees or you know jump those are all allowed and so what I realized is if I was going to homeschool Taro his name is Taro um, I was going to have to, a bet, the best way for him to learn was to continue that trend um, and that method of outdoor learning because it just worked so well for him. But when I went online and I searched for resources, there wasn't anything there. And so I started doing my own thing and a friend told me I needed to write it down and share it with others. And I'm so thankful for her because she was right and um, that's how I started it. Um, so yeah, the sensory piece was a huge, huge one for our family. Um, 
using outdoor um, real materials like pine cones and sticks is actually connects abstract concepts with concrete examples. And, and there's some studies that show that it, it connects them better than like our plastic math manipulatives. And I found that really interesting because they're real objects. Um, it also improves mental health um, and it supports a variety of learners. So it's art, it's like naturally meeting different kids' needs in different places, all by just going outside without any extra planning. Um, it's just, and a lot of these you can get from just going outside. You can do the exact same lesson you were doing and still get those benefits, which I think is awesome. So this is a little overview. Um, ideas to take your math outside. So you can do math themed walks, um, natural materials as manipulatives, data collection and graphing, play-based learning, which I'm big into, and mud play, which sounds like play, but there's so much you can do with it. So we'll start with math themed walks. So this is my older son, Finn, maybe two years ago in um, town. We live out in the country, so we have to go to town to do, and some of you might have to do the same thing to do some of these things. So for shape walks, we love to go to town um, and look for different shapes. So he's showing off some awesome circles. Um, manhole covers are really good. Um, there's shapes everywhere in the man-made world. And it's really great to take a walk and record all of those. Um, angle walks for older kids, looking for right angles, looking for acute angles, obtuse angles, all those kind of things are really fun to find. You can find both shapes and angles in the forest and in nature. They're just a little more subtle. Um, flowers, um, trees often fall in different angles, sticks are in different angles, grasses are in different angles. It's just a little less obvious and there's just more examples if you go to town. Um, we like to look for odd and even numbers, even just on your street, um, while you're driving, on signs, route signs, speed limits, um, that can be really fun. Um, place value. We like to go for walks and say, we're going to round every number we see to the nearest hundred, or we're going to round every number we see to the nearest, or find all the decimals and round them to the near, nearest tenth. Um, so those are going to be some easy ways um, that you can just throw some math into your outdoors. Um, and it doesn't have to be the great outdoors. It can just be town or your street. Um, Using natural materials as manipulatives is another great way um, to integrate the outdoors. So I have some examples here of some things that we have done. Um, place value sticks. So instead of those plastic place value blocks, you don't need to buy those. You can just make them with sticks. Um, so we have bundles of 10 sticks and then single sticks. And then often we use this, um, this is like a giant hundreds chart here in the center. And you can, um, collect, so he's collecting a hundred objects there. Um, so that's a great activity uh, for all ages. My, my oldest kid likes to participate in that as well. Um, it's a nice challenge. We've done it on the beach. Um, we've done it in the forest. We've done it every, everywhere. And you get a different kind of um, object everywhere you do it. And it's a, it's a nice challenge. And they're constantly counting up how many they have, how many more they need. Like there's a lot of math that goes into it. It sounds really simple, but it, it's, it's actually got a lot that goes into it. And estimating how many more we need, of how long it's going to take. Are we even going to be able to finish this? Um, I also like to make 10 frames. Um, you can just use chalk on a rock. You, I have some cloth ones that I drew with a Sharpie. There's some fancy ones that people make that are sewn and look very pretty. There's wooden ones. There's some made out of popsicle sticks. You can do, you can just lay sticks into a 10 frame, but 10 frames are really good at building numeracy, especially in kindergarten and first grade. Um, you can start seeing numbers. So you know that if the top half of that, you can't see all five, but if this top half was all full, that that's five. And if only one more was filled, you would say that's six because you have five and six. So you're starting to what's called subitizing, which is seeing a collection of things and knowing how many there are without counting. You don't want kids to start way back at one and go one, two, three, four, five, six. We don't want that. We want them to see five in one or all six. So that's a really easy thing to do outside. And kids love to play with flowers. So if you have flowers that are okay to pick, like they're very numerous, that can be a great thing to use. 
we were just talking about this. We have lots of snow where I live. So um, we do a lot with snow when we can get out. We get out every day in the winter, just not as long as in the summer. Um, and so this is like a half melted um, snowman. We were kind of tracking how, if he was shrinking or not. Um, so that's fun. We also do a lot with like uh, recyclables and um, putting the snow, if you have packable snow, you can like make 3D figures out of it. You can draw on the snow. There's so many things you can do with the snow. And of course, counting. These are just um, some wild apples that we were counting with that day. So their manipulatives are everywhere and it, it varies where you live and just use what you have. These are obviously examples from where I live. I live in New York, um, not New York City, but upstate New York in the forest, in a log house. You can kind of see the logs in my picture. Um, and um, these, this is what grows near me. If I lived on the beach, I would have tons of shells and beach pictures, you know, so. It's all what lives near you. The other thing we love to do and is super easy, doesn't really require a lot of planning is um, data collection and graphing. So you can use nature observations as an opportunity for data collection and graphing. We love um, bird species and the number of birds over time. This is super easy and you can do it from inside if you have a bird feeder and it's like really cold. It's a great thing to do in the middle of winter. Um, we also love to do the temperature change. It has negative numbers built in if you live in a cold place like where we live or where you guys probably live. So it automatically, they can see, whoa, that's what negative means, you know, cause it's going down below the zero line. Um, and that can be really great way to make that concrete. We like to graph rain or snowfall, flower colors or species on walks, um, animals or insects observed on a walk or just like a 10 minute blitz of looking around. Um, tally chart of sunny days versus cloudy days, because um, tallies are a really important early um, math skill. Um, natural materials collected. If you just go on a walk and your kids are collecting stuff, you can make a tally chart of what you, um, or a bar chart of what you collected at the end. Super easy. Get some graph paper out. Um, garden harvest fields, if you do gardening. Um, and we like to time our sledding runs to see how fast we can get going. Um, that's always a really popular one. Um, you can experiment with like, if you have two kids in the sled, does it go faster or slower, et cetera. It can be really fun. Um, a stopwatch or your cell phone work really good for that. Um, I also am big on play-based learning, especially for our youngest learners. And in wild math kindergarten, I really try to integrate some ideas that you can um, use to encourage math play as opposed to like explicit le lessons all of the time, because that exploration is just as important as any instruction, probably more so. So I say uh, some suggestions are adding the natural materials to play spaces. So a bowl full of pine cones, a pile of really nice rocks, um, these things are really attractive, flowers, flower petals, whatever is abundant where and you have available or you've collected, we like acorns a lot. Um, putting a scale or a balance, like in the picture, my son there, and that you can see I put nature materials next to it and you just set that out and kids are drawn to it and there's so much learning and experimenting and you can ask them questions like, you know, if I put this big rock in there, how many, uh, there's some like chestnuts and acorns in there, would you be able to fit enough in there to equal the, make the weight equal? Um, all kinds of things like, can you make the two balanced sides equal? What can you put on both sides? Um, all kinds of things. They love that. Um, cash, re cash registers, if you have one of these still knocking around, put it outside. Toys can go outside. And if you put it outside and you put natural materials or you put it in your mud kitchen, all of a sudden the kids are inspired to play store or a restaurant or anything. And they just usually lack for customers, which is my, <laughs> I'm always the customer. And so it can get a little old, but it is super, super good for their math learning. Um, I like to have paper, pencil, Sharpies, clipboards, chalk available. I also recommend taking some of these things with you like on a nature walk. I always have chalk. I always have um, a pencil, Sharpie, some paper. I'm like that nerdy mom out there. Measuring tape, it's bad. Um, I like to have rulers and measuring tapes outside. So it's good to know where, have the kids know where these things are and kind of have a place for them. So if they think they're like, 
they're playing something and they want to make paper money. They're like, oh, I don't have to go inside or whatever. I can just go get the paper and the pencil over on the spot in the yard in a plastic bin or whatever, or in the garage or the shed or whatever. And that way it doesn't interrupt their play to get what they need. They're able to just get that independently and keep going. Cake pans are like huge for fractions and restaurant play and addition um, and subtraction. So I really recommend them. My favorite way to get them is to go to um, thrift stores and get old ones. Um, garage sales are really good too, if you have those kind of things. Um, and I'd like to collect the rectangular ones, the square ones, the round ones. And the best thing about them is they don't rust um, and they don't break like plastic. So they're, they'll last for a long time. Um, and I use cake pans in my math curriculum up to fifth grade. So they're really, you get a long length for them. Uh, and then of course, games, hide and seek are, is great for counting. Um, I like to play games, board games outside. We really get kind of creative. Um, so here's my, my fraction example. Um, we use mud, sand, or snow, depending on the season, um, to you to learn all kinds of things with our cake pans. Um, so I said earlier about the different shapes. This is one of my favorites, the rectangle. Um, you can make pizza and add or subtract toppings for younger kids. Um, that's a really exciting. The picture is showing how to make equivalent fractions and showing that. So it was like two thirds and then I put that middle over it and I made four sixths. Um, I'm, that middle, I don't know, it's like a, I think it's a piece of goldenrod, dried goldenrod or a stick um, to show that. And so I have very explicit pictures in Wild Math fifth, fifth grade of how to teach fractions with mud pies. So. so ideas to take reading and writing outside. So I recently, embarked on reading and writing outside because I felt like that's the other big sphere that I know I'm always trying to hit as a homeschooler. I, we do reading and writing and math and that's like our big thing. Um, and so I was like, challenged myself, can I, can I take reading and take it outside? And um, I think I succeeded with wild reading. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so learning and practicing reading out, so, outdoors movable alphabet. So you can see two diff three different examples in this picture. So the top picture is um, ice letters that I put food coloring in and I froze and then I pop them out and then you can use them in the snow. You can also use them in the summer and they float in the water or you can use them in the bath. Lots of different um, ways to use that. And the bottom picture, he's writing with the rock one. I may took rocks and I took a Sharpie and I wrote the letters on there. And then we also have the plastic like magnetic letters um, in that picture. And I have them mixed together in kind of like a craft bin and they're all labeled by letter. So you can take it outside and they don't get all mixed up. But that is like my number one way to integrate phonics and reading and spelling easily outside. Um, I also love chalk. I love it for math. I love it for reading. I love it for writing. It's just a fantastic, inexpensive material. If you have pavement, I don't, but if you have pavement, you can write with chalk all over your driveway or your sidewalk. We have a deck, so we write on that or on the side of the house. You can write on tree trunks, you can write on rocks, it's, you can write on boards. It, it's really phenomenal, it's like all the things you can do with it. Um, and I have a lot of games um, and activities to, that use chalk and wild reading. Um, I love to go on a walk and with younger kids and say, let's look for all the plants or animals that begin with the, the M sound, the M sound, or let's find things that rhyme with ick, like stick, right? Or and they get really creative and it's great. Um, it's just another way to kind of integrate these things into what you might already be doing. Um, picture word sentence scavenger hunts. So just like I like to do math scavenger hunts with popsicle sticks with the facts on them, you can also do the same thing with words written on popsicle sticks or um, clothes pins and pictures. I clip them all over the yard. Um, and then they had to find those pictures and use the movable alphabet to spell those words. 
Um, you can also have them be sentences and they either have to write the sentence or read the sentence. So easy ways to do it. Um, a little bit about how to integrate writing. So um, you can label plants. We did this in the spring. My son wrote all the little labels for all the little flowers that were coming up in our garden. So like we had crocuses and daffodils and he wrote those words and he labeled them um, kind of like a bot botanical garden. You can record the weather on a daily basis and have them write that down. You can do some shape poems, which is on the um, my right here in the picture. This is some shape poems about leaves. So we brainstormed a whole bunch of words that described leaves and then we um, wrote them. And you can see I have different levels here. One my younger kid wrote and one my older kid wrote and they wrote it in the shape of the leaves. Um, five sen senses writing. Um, sitting outside and using their five senses and um, as observations. So what do you smell? What do you taste? What do you see? Um, what do you feel? Sit spots are a great way to do this too, where you have kids sit for five or 10 minutes in a special spot they find outside and just observe. And then you can talk about it and write about it afterwards. That's really good for all ages, even adults. Um, chalk again, you can never get enough chalk. Um, and you can also make letters with natural materials. And this is a really good example of when we did the alphabet. So a lot of times we hang up alphabet posters in our house um, and that's great, but um, this is one that we made out of natural materials. So we went out and we collected all kinds of natural materials. And then we came in and as a family, um, we glued them into each letter shape. And then we kind of watercolored the, the background to make it more colorful. And then we, that was our letter um, poster that year. And it, it was really beautiful. And I, I really liked it. And it was just a little bit different um, than if you bought one and it's free, it's out there. So. so how do you get started with outdoor learning? I don't want people to get really overwhelmed because it's so easy to do, but it can be so, so simple to get started. You can simply take your regular lesson or your morning circle or your morning read aloud or whatever you're doing. And you can just do that outside. You don't have to think of something special. Um, there's a lot of research out there that says just changing the location of your lesson um, increases attention, increases engagement, um, and increases like attitude even into the next lesson. So let's say you just took your read aloud outside and you read to the kids outside and you're like, all right, now we got to go back inside. That whole next lesson, if you did another one inside, the, that increasing in engagement and tension would stay. So all you have to do is change your location. You don't even have to do anything special. I think that's fabulous. Um, so yes, yeah, so try... The other step is to try just planning one lesson a week that uses the outdoors for the content and as more, add more as you feel comfortable. Um, the kids in this picture, we were doing some nature study in September. We were at a pond um, and there was these turtles down there and frogs and we were drawing the turtles. So that's an easy way to integrate some art and some science, check those boxes. That's how I like to do it. Um, take some of those nature or neighborhood walks once a week, pick one and try it, see how it goes. Um, and schedule a field trip. Those, you know, we often don't think of field trips as something that could be outdoor learning, but there's so much botanical gardens, historical houses. Um, we've gone to cemeteries. <laughs> there's so much interesting things in cemeteries. There's numbers, there's dates, there's names, there's history. Um, we, they can be really interesting, especially if you go to like really weird ones, little small old ones. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, interesting rabbit trails of things like, well, what was this person? Let's go find out. Let's go to the library and see if we can look them up. Um, state parks, zoos, all of those can count, um, as outdoor learning. They can also be great, um, in the middle of the winter. So places like zoos or museums often have, um, things you can visit that are related to the natural world, but may not be outside. So you can kind of bridge that gap if you need to, or you're just, it's too cold, or I don't know, everyone has issues, right? Um, everyone needs something sometimes. So um, 
that's all I have about practical ideas of how to get outside. And I just wanted to um, mention wild math, which was my first curriculum. I have grades K through five. So if you're low on ideas, um, they're all there and they all, all the grades now have weekly plans. So this was something that people really asked me for. Um, and I worked really hard to get it out there. So now um, they're suggested, suggested weekly plans for you um, every week um, to get through the curriculum. Um, and all wild math have book, book lists and board game lists because I'm really into board games for practicing facts as opposed to worksheets. So each unit has a book list and each unit has um, a board game list or card game, whatever, just games. So we have some pictures here of my kids in the winter. We made some frozen ice spheres. That was really fun. Um, on the beach, we made angles. This is um, one of those homemade 10 frames with a, it's just a piece of fabric that I wrote on with a Sharpie and then measuring trees. See, I told you I bring measuring tapes out in the woods because you know, when you see a big tree, you have to measure it. <laughs> my poor children. Um, and then wild reading is my newest curriculum. It is a level one curriculum. So this is really for kids that are just learning how to read. Um, they may know some of their letters. They may be ready to learn letters. They may be ready to blend words. And um, I've worked really hard. I am a special ed teacher um, and I really believe in the science of how kids read. Um, and I wanted to make sure that whatever program I wrote really followed that. Um, and the gist of it is that 40% um, of kids, around 40, 30, 40% kids will learn to read no matter how they are taught or if they're not taught at all. But the remaining 60% of kids will need some instruction and it usually needs to be phonics based. Um, so I made sure that that was how I structured my program so that all learners are successful because the studies also show that even if you are in those 40% of kids that learn to read on their own, um, they still benefit from a phonics structured approach. And when I say structured, I don't mean it's like really rigid. I just mean that they, the sounds and the phonemes are presented in a sequential one at a time thought out way as opposed to just like all random and mismatched um, and they build on each other. So they're never reading words that um, they haven't learned the sounds for yet. So um, these are some pictures. Of course, I wrote this in the pandemic. So all of the pictures almost are of my son. So <laughs> there was no variety to be had. Um, we were laughing about that when we were about ready to publish it because I was like, oh, People are going to be like, what is with this kid? He's like in every picture, but it's all I had. So um, each week is a word family and sight words. It's um, on a story. So there's a story about a mouse named Matilda and her adventures every single week, climbing up a maj majestic mountain. And um, that introduces the letter and the sound and theme of the week. And then every week also starting in week six has a word family and sight words. So um, it really, it's a, it has all kinds of things going on. Lots of multi-sensory stuff. It has lots of book lists, lots and lots of enrichment activities that are nature-based or relate to the letter theme. Um, so really wild reading could be cover your science, definitely some of your social studies, art and music, and it could be really all encompassing if you wanted it to be. Um, but that's pretty much all I have. So you can find me at discoverwildlearning.com. And I am on Instagram and Facebook at Discover Wild Learning. And I post a lot about my homeschool adventures and information about um, wild math and wild reading. And this is a page from wild reading that my youngest son did for the letter M. <laughs> that's all I have. I Stop my screen sharing. Well, I have one logistics question for you. And yeah. so when you were talking about you're out with your kids and you guys are measuring, who is keeping track of that data? Do you write that down? Do your kids write that down? Because I've noticed the juggling of, of materials seems to be really hard with my kids. So yeah. 
So it can be, it depends. I have an 11 year old who's pretty with it. So sometimes he does the recording. Um, but if they were measuring, like in that picture, they're doing the measuring and they're telling me, I am fine with writing that down and holding that, that thought for them um, until we get home or even just discussing it. And sometimes it's just a discussion. It's like, wow, this is, you know, like six feet around. That's as big as dad. Or, you know, like you really start, you know, talking about it and in the lesson is in the, that discussion when it's, especially when it's something like, um, not planned, like you're just walking along and you're like, look at this big tree. I wonder how big it is, is what usually what my people say. And so we're like, let's see. Cause then I'm like, let's see. Cause I've got, <laughs> I pull out my stuff. I've got a measuring tape in here somewhere. Um, you know, and so then we're talking about it and then they're kind of like, wow, yeah, this is really big. And like, what is it, how much bigger is it than all the other trees? Like, does that, what does that mean? This tree was here before here where we live everything was farmland and everything's grown back up. So there's, when you see a really big tree, you know, there's some history to talk about there. Um, but yeah, I usually, I can go both ways. If the kids are older, I definitely want them to write. If they're younger, um, I think writing it down when you're on the fly like that for them is, is totally fine. That's super helpful. And then, so now I'm wondering, um, if your kids, if, if your curriculum is mostly not worksheets, how do you make sure that they're learning to write numbers? How do you ensure that? Yeah. So help us out with that. Yeah. So that's where the chalk comes in handy, right? Um, that's where, cause we do a lot of writing with chalk um, and there's whole in wild math. So every one of those skills is outlined and then you will have a list of activities that you can do to write numbers one through 10, um, like in kindergarten. Um, and then some of the other things we like to do are writing in sand or mud or with mud, um, like as paint kind of. We like to write in the snow with watercolors. You can just write in the snow with a stick or your mitten or glove. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to write. We like to use natural materials to make the shapes. You really, you know, can really, there's a lot of variety and they're all really hands-on as opposed to just doing a worksheet and practicing the letter two over and over. Um, you can also have kids write, like as if you're working say with a 10 frame and you're working on adding or counting, it is okay to have a clipboard and have them record those numbers as they're doing it or in a notebook and say, all right, you, how many do you have? There's seven. Let's write the number seven down, right? And, and you, it's absolutely, so then you're getting some pencil work in there too. Um, so that's how I do it. Right. I, I was just thinking, okay, so there's lots of chances to write. They're just not on worksheets. So right. I wanted to make sure that nobody was worried. Yes. Yes. And and the same thing with math facts, right? Like the studies show that um, doing lots and lots and lots of problems is actually really ineffective, especially after about eight or 10 problems. Um, so, but when you're playing a game like um, addition war, kids are doing a lot of addition facts and they're doing 20, 30 of them and they're not even thinking about it. Like, you know, um, and you just practice 30 addition facts in one game, you know. Um, in a word about fluency, people, you know, get really hung up on having kids memorize the facts. Um, I think that, and I think most educators agree that it's not really about the memorizing, it's about fluency. So if they can answer addition and subtraction facts or multiplication facts within three to five seconds, um, using a strategy or from memory, that is perfectly fine. That is fluent, um, you know, and they will get better as they go, but we, we don't need to do flashcards until they have every single one memorized like that. It's the strategies are fine. Um, and I, I do outline a lot of those strategies in wild math, um, you know, making a 10 and doubles and all kinds of things, um, doubles plus one, um, that can really help kids that have trouble memorizing all of those facts too. So, 
Well, if any of the rest of you have questions, please ask. You, I don't have to be the only question asker. So I'll take a minute and let you guys ask. Hey, Rachel, on your curriculum, um, great stuff. I'm really interested. When you go on there to purchase that, is it electronic or is that printed or both? Yeah, so it is a digital file. Um, and you will get it an email that you can download it and you should be taken right back to that page to be able to download it. And then there's a couple places you can have it printed at home. Wild math is pretty easy to print at home. Wild reading is about, I'll show it to you. It's about 400 pages. <laughs> um, so I really usually suggest, I have a couple suggestions on my website um, of places that will print and ship it to you for cheaper than someplace like Staples, like a lot cheaper. Um, also, you can just print as you go by chapter, either with wild reading chapters are about 10 to 15 pages or with wild math. Um, but yeah, I, it's only me, so I don't really have a way to have them all printed and shipped and doing all of that would just be too much. I'd never get wild reading two done. <laughs> it's a good question though. Thanks. So for those of you listening um, with our school, you know we can't be reimbursed for printing. And so you would need to um, either purchase a printer and be reimbursed for the printer or be reimbursed for the ink or re be re reimbursed for the paper, but you can't be reimbursed for sending it to be printed. And then the other thing you'll want to remember is if it's a digital file, then you have to purchase it yourself and get reimbursed instead of doing a requisition. So those are all just really um, important things, but kind of technical things to remember but i mean don't let any of that stop you you can still do all of this and then we had a question in the chat about what was the war game that you mentioned yeah so that's it's not an, it's not a game i made up but <laughs> it's a great game um so it's just like war only you take you know with like a deck of cards or you can make a deck of number cards out of like paper or an index cards um, and you take each player takes two cards and you add them together. And so whoever has the bigger sum wins all of those cards. So it's just like war, right? But you're adding the numbers. You can also subtract the, the numbers, but you always make sure that you're subtracting the biggest from the smallest and you can multiply them. So there's a lot of ways to play that game. It's a great game. Does your um, school take, do purchase orders? Cause I get a lot of charters that send me purchase orders. I just wondered about that. So um, we can requisition materials, any material in our school will purchase it for us. They just don't purchase digital items for us because it gets messy making sure that digital item gets to the owner. It does, yes. We have um, close to 1500 students and our poor, amazing requisitions lady. She, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we don't necessarily do purchase orders, but we, our school will order almost anything for you as long as it's not That's really good. Really yeah, that's great. We don't have that where we live. We don't have any charter home, homeschoolers are on their own. It is, it's rough. <laughs> no, I often feel like our school is a great big gift. So um, I just started working here in the last few years, but before that I was just a parent and I, every year I was like, I can't believe I have all this money and all this support and all these resources to homeschool my kids. So it's really yeah. amazing. It is. Okay. So any more questions? all good. I no guess question. you just hear my daughter in the background doing some art oh, projects. <laughs> well, Rachel, thank you so much for creating this, first of all, because I already feel a little bit more direction in what I'm doing with my kids. And then for coming and telling us all about it and giving us ideas and putting it all down in a curriculum we can buy. So if we want all those games, we can go do that. So, and I just want to remind anyone listening, if you do want to purchase games, you can totally purchase games um, under your math course. So if you've got like um, second grade math, you can just add on all those fun games just as items under that math course. You don't just purchase curriculum. So please go buy all the games. Mm -hmm. um, please go get yourself a tin frame and start having fun. And um, if you have more questions, Rachel's information will be listed on our website underneath where we post this workshop. So you can always reach out to her and um, tell her how amazing her curriculum is and thank her yourself. But thanks again, Rachel, for coming and spending your afternoon hanging out with us. No problem. Thanks for having me, guys. I enjoyed it. Hopefully I can come and visit Alaska sometime soon. Please, please. Mm -hmm.
Yes. And there's lots of thank yous in the chat. Oh, so. that's great. Okay. Well, have a wonderful afternoon. I'm going to stop recording and um, you guys can go enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>